So hear these words from the epistle to the Ephesians. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you. And how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed in his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is... The Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of God's power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have access to God, in boldness and confidence through faith in him. May God add blessings to the readings of these words. Will you pray with me? So, Holy One, we have gathered to share words we will spend this time thinking words and speaking words and occasionally singing words. The words will bounce all over the building, all over this room. And we are trusting that in this new year, you will gather up all these words and arrange them into an acrostic of beauty and truth and holiness. In the name of Jesus, amen. I don't really know how you and your family feel about the movie Shakespeare in Love, but our household has been divided on this question for years. My husband, Don, and I, on the one hand, we really love this movie ever since 19-whatever, and we watch it every five or six years or so just because it's there. Now, Marilyn, our 30-something daughter, she has no use for it. In fact, she despises the movie and is so enraged by it that she refuses to give any reasons for her feelings. No matter, really. The point of my bringing all this up is that there is a refrain throughout the movie that begins like this. Philip Henslow, a character played by Jeffrey Rush, says, Mr. Finneyman, allow me to explain about the theater business the natural condition is one of insurmountable obstacles on the road to imminent disaster. So what do we do? Nothing, says Mr. Henslow. Strangely enough, it all turns out well. How? I don't know. It's a mystery. The refrain punctuates the movie as the plot unfolds. As things get more and more complicated and troubles pile up, Philip Henslow or someone says, it'll be all right. Don't worry. Who knows? It's a mystery, but it'll turn out all right. 
So it's the second day of Epiphany, the ancient Christian celebration of mystery revealed in Jesus the Christ. And we are here together in this chapel to begin a new year in hot pursuit of that mystery or maybe sleepy pursuit or anxious pursuit or overwhelmed pursuit. We're looking for mystery. We're looking into it for the thing that helps us at least face the insurmountable obstacles on the road to imminent disaster. We hope we find what will overcome them in the mystery. We hope we find at the very least some purpose in facing them purpose that we can practice as surely as my own pastor Kevin Howell practices the guitar. Late first century Ephesus was a major hub on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire, a place of wealth and prosperity, of international trade, a portal to the plains and mountains of Asia Minor, but underneath the glitter and the glamour The majority of the people were struggling to keep themselves and their families alive in an empire that thought nothing for them but what they could contribute to its own power and wealth. And in the midst of this majority of the people live some saints, the holy ones, to whom this author writes in the name of Paul, the ancestor of this writer and his readers. And if you want to debate whether or not Paul wrote Ephesians, I refer you to anyone named Carter in this building. (laughs) And the writer reveals his The empire. And the writer reveals his understanding of mystery to these people who have gathered around a new purpose beyond enriching their patrons in the empire. A purpose of the proclamation of grace offered by Jesus Christ. And note this, a purpose of inclusion, grace offered to all even those nasty Gentiles. This, says the author, is my understanding of the mystery, and this is our purpose. And 20 years later, I find his words way too easy, way too concrete, almost as if he is squeezing all the mystery out of mystery, when I'm still relying on incense and haze and dim outlines of flickerings of the shadow of God occasionally on the walls, because I know full well that this gospel mystery has not really worked out so well for a lot of people today or in the past 20 centuries. And then I remember again that those Jesus followers of the first century, even in Ephesus, were trapped every bit as much as we are trapped between what is and what ought to be, caught in cycles of repudiation and violence against them, against their friends, against their families, even as they reject the so-called grace offered by the empire, caught in unending circles of illness and pain, caught in infinite loops of petty argument and bitter memory, tangled up in their own despair and discouragement. This is not what I signed up for, they say. Where's the glory? Where is the victory? Where is Jesus? So this author speaks of a truth still shrouded in mystery, speaks of a truth in which he says the Lord is and will continue and will always dwell among us, in which evil, injustice, suffering will be destroyed, in which the brightness of the day will overcome the deep and scary shadows of night, 
And again, though he uses language I wouldn't use, he speaks so confidently about his own insight that I cannot help but be drawn to it and hear in his words comfort as a reminder that trouble, sorrow, bitterness, jets, bombs, Ebola, leukemia, volcanoes, division, alienation from friends, hunger, cancer, unemployment, economic inequality, family arguments, domestic violence, church conflict, and Middle Eastern pain, even the travails of the doctor of ministry life are not God's ultimate words. I hear a whisper in the midst of it all, all will be well. It's the English mystic Julian of Norwich this morning that I've gone to. I confess that mystics like prophets are people that I don't want to be with. They are generally fairly scary, fierce even. They experience realities beyond the ones that their realities frighten me. Sometimes they see right into the very heart of God and they expect me to live as if I do too. Julian was the kind of person who made ordinary people like me say when they saw her coming, quick, hide in here, before she makes us think something that we don't want to think or do something that we don't want to do for someone we do not like. So Julian, this anchoress, a person who has withdrawn occasionally from the world for the sake of her religious conviction, she lived at the end of the 14th century she was apparently, some say, a mature, sane, sober woman, at least by the standards of the 14th century. And she made three requests from God. She wanted to receive a vision uh, that would make her more aware of the suffering of Jesus and of Mary so that she might understand more fully the passion of Christ. Well, sounds a little crazy. She wants to receive a bodily illness that would somehow purge her of everything that kept her separate from God. Now I'm really starting to doubt her sanity. She wanted to receive three wounds. The wound of true contrition. The wound of natural compassion. And the wound of fulfilled and full-hearted longing for God. Fully insane now. I told you mystics are not people I want to be around, for they take God and life very, very seriously, and they place God and God's purposes above all else, including their own comfort and their own well-being, and the response to her requests come in the form of revelations or showings in which she did indeed experience the passion of Christ, the terrors of bodily illness, and her three wounds. And in the 13th revelation, as she struggled with her own sense of sin, she heard Jesus say, it is true that sin is the cause of all this pain. But all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And I'm thinking that what she offers is more than a bumper sticker or an embroidered pillow epithet where I usually find her words. For she offers the same recognition that the Ephesians are offered centuries before, that yes, indeed, there's pain. Yes, indeed, there is unbearable tension between what is and what ought to be, and that yet somehow, in ways wholly unknowable to us, God will work out God's purposes for wholeness, for wellness, for inclusion 
and we ourselves might actually see and know such purposes as long as we don't get too caught up in our own definitions of all will be well, for this claim surely doesn't mean well, that things will be exactly as I want them to be, and surely doesn't mean will we, that we will never ever suffer pain, illness, tragedy, nor does it mean that the people who have hurt us the most will suddenly disappear from our lives, and it certainly doesn't mean that we will be allowed to hold on to our own comforts, our own privileges, our own self-righteousness to the detriment of others. It means, as the Ephesian author said so long ago, that God's purpose for wholeness for wellness, for all creation, for all creatures, even for us, will indeed be worked out with or without us. And in Jesus, we see God's movement toward that wellness and wholeness. And then and only then will all things be well. And in the meantime, I confess to you that I began to prepare this sermon in the glow of the Christmas tree lights of our house while we didn't have to work here at Phillips Theological Seminary. And running around my carpet was an absolutely adorable 20-month-old granddaughter practicing her adorability with all her might and main. And it was just so beautiful, and I thought, yes, all will be well. And then I woke up Sunday morning and decided to skip church and instead <laughs> spent the day watching the news that began with George Stephanopoulos and his parade of persons speaking of what is happening in the Middle East. And suddenly I thought, well, you know, really all is not well. All will not be well. All will never be well. What if we were to speak wellness and wholeness as an act of defiance and of subversion? And what if we were to practice this same purpose as an act of protest as we refuse to buy into the despair that the grace of God which we find in Jesus is not big enough for all people? What if, what if we joined in the prophetic proclamation of mystery revealed that is not found in acts of terrorism or aggression what if we instead insisted that grace is offered by Jesus to all people, not just to those we like or who like us or who are like us? What if we study the dimensions of grace with its injections of justice and healing and we study it again as an act of strength against all that threatens to overwhelm us? What if we practice making things well, even if we can't complete the work, and know somehow in mystery that it will be well, that all will be well, that all manner of things shall be well, and we want to be a part of making it so? Let us whisper. Let us shout, and let us practice that purpose in the name of Jesus. Amen.